You would think that we would kind of already know everything that grows here, because we do have one of the best studied floors on the planet, and I mean that literally. But plants are very dynamic, the ranges are changing, shifting, and not only that, but you have to remember that every botanist has their bias, and based on what they've studied, they're very, very skilled in some groups, and sometimes they're really pretty deficient in other groups, and we all have those biases. So this particular plant, this big, big showy member of the morning glory family, which is uh, Calistegia sylvatica, and it's called, its common name, um, is the short-stalked false bindweed, had never been reported east of New York. So that was as far east as it was known to occur. And yet, there are probably a dozen herbarium collections. Unfortunately for Massachusetts, there are three of these. Two of them are now under the Quabbin Reservoir. But one of them, one of them appears to have escaped the inundation. So this is a historically occurring plant that was not only never known for New England, but never known for Massachusetts. Um, and interesting, because now that we know that, we can prioritize trying to find it. This is one of my, one of the favorite things that we learned in this project, as simple as it may sound. This plant, Carex capillaris, is called the hair-like sedge. And this species is a calcophile, so it means it grows in these high pH soils that are often influenced by some type of calcareous bedrock. So we're talking really, really rich areas. And what's really interesting is in Vermont and in Maine, this plant grows kind of in the lowlands, on river shore cliffs and outcrops and things of that nature. But weirdly enough, the plants that grow in New Hampshire are in the Alpine Garden, all the way up on Mount Washington. I always thought that was so bizarre. The very first time I learned about this distribution, but I let it go, and sort of festered for a decade. And then I came across this paper where in Europe, they were recognizing two different forms of this that they recognized as subspecies. So these are plants they believe to have real genetic differences. And in fact, some people even treat these as two different species. And I looked at our plants and realized that we, in fact, have these two subspecies, but no one had ever reported it. And I just want you to notice two things, and we won't go into all the nitty-gritty detail, but these reproductive structures that you see here called perigenia, notice that they have these very pale, almost whitish green scales, as opposed to the color that you see over here, which is this real rust brown. And that structure way up there, which are the pollen-bearing flowers of this plant, I want you to notice the same structure is here, almost totally hidden inside of this uh, enfolding leaf here as opposed to standing way out beyond. Now these are the tiny little details that we often have to look at to separate species of sedges. This is the first time this has ever been reported from New England, and it turns out to be yet more justification of how special Mount Washington is because of these unique plants that grow there. I told you I wasn't going to hold anything back, by the way, and really let you understand what being a plant taxonomist is about. So here's another sedge, Carex resnicekii. Believe it or not, they're still finding plants new to science, even from this part of the world. This was found from an herbarium specimen in Rhode Island, and we went out looking for it in Connecticut and actually found the first extant population in New England of this tiny, tiny early flowering sedge. We actually had to go looking for it um, in May and June, and we found this on West Rock in Connecticut. This wasn't even named until approximately 2007, 2008. So all of those older botanical manuals don't even have this species in it. And understand if the plant isn't in the manual, no one will know that it exists. Because if they happen to come across this plant, and they use the identification keys in those manuals, this will get pigeonholed into another name. Does that make sense? So if you don't know it exists, you can't find it, which means you can't conserve it. So here we have a sedge, one extant population and one historical population, so two total in all of New England, and it's not even in any books, well, except the new one that we've been able to do. And, and I really want to highlight what this means for conservation in New England. For example, there is a sedge which is called Carex vasilans, and vasilans means swinging. 
in Latin or Greek. I don't actually recall which one it is, but that's irrelevant. I don't want any comments about the lifestyle of this particular planet. It's called Swingy because it blows in the wind. And this particular sedge was, is listed or was to be listed as a rare plant here in Massachusetts. But it turns out when the specimens were examined, they were all this hybrid. And you may or may not know that the Massachusetts um, Endangered Species Act does not afford protection to hybrids. And so this is something that not only did they have the wrong species, but it wasn't even the type of plant that would be afforded protection. But that wouldn't be known, again, without having someone that could just be dedicated to studying these plants and determining this. And the last thing you want to do is spend a lot of time surveying for these plants. And, and although all land conservation and land preservation is valuable, but given, again, limited funding, you don't necessarily want to purchase a block of land to protect a plant that's not even the plant you thought it was. Does that make sense? So good. <laughs> good. All right. And we have all kinds of things happening. It isn't just the native and rare species, but it's also, remember, the non-native species. Viola chinensis has been reported under various names from Massachusetts as an escape from a botanical garden in Cambridge, and it's been reported for essentially a century here in New England. But it turns out that when I went to study those plants so that I could include them in this manual, the description of Viola chinensis that's written in the floras from China didn't match the plants I was looking at. It turns out they were just misidentified. And so all this time we thought that was the species, it turns out that it was really Viola japonica that had been introduced. Now, you have to try to imagine this. For example, the New England Botanical Club with a quarter million specimens, and in that building, building there are five million herbarium specimens. That's a lot. And so if you're having to file through these to record distribution, sometimes people get going and they get in a pattern and they're writing things down and filing through, and they don't really take the time to stop and look at the label. And so if you look at the previous edition of the Massachusetts checklist, the one from 99, you'll notice that Lupinus albus, which is obviously a species of lupin, and Linaria supina, which is related to the butter and eggs for people that know uh, that wild plant. These are recorded as species that are wild plants of Massachusetts. But it turns out, when you looked at the labels, it said cultivated in my garden and, and growing outside of my house in my garden. Like these were plants that people had just collected to possibly have a reference or something that they enjoyed. And they were never part of the flora. And that actually happened a lot. So we actually take this catalog of plants, and sometimes the catalog gets smaller because we're not just adding to it, but we're also excluding from it. Now, you want to see nitpick detail. <laughs> this is the type of stuff we have to go through. Botanists in Connecticut found an introduced plant. And they sent it up here to Harvard, and Merritt Lyndon Fernald, who was the botanist at the time working um, at the Gray Herbarium, identified it as this plant, Linaria reticulata spontane. And this name that you see here, an abbreviation, is the author of the person who first named this plant and first published that name. But unfortunately, a tiny little error was made, because when Harger et al. in the 1920s produce an updated catalog of plants of Connecticut, they wrote down Linaria reticulata wildeno. So they goofed the authority names. Notice those two are different. Now this is a case where people accidentally publish the exact same name for two different species. You can see they look very different. And back then, in the 1800s and, and even sometimes before in the 1700s, people didn't have websites to go to where they could say, oh, somebody's already used that name, right? It just, it happened a fair amount then that the same name would get used. And the rules say, well, we can't have the same name being used for two separate <coughs> plants because that obviously leads to confusion. So what ends up happening is we create new names for them. Well, it turns out today that this one is called Linaria pinifolia, and this is truly what was found in New England 
uh, back in the 1900s, 